This is better. This is good. Yeah. <coughs> Hello, hello. Yeah. Good. Please sit down. Please sit down. Sorry. I got the list of all of you now. From one from Argentina, from Australia five, Austria one, Brazil two, Canada two, Croatia one, Ecuador one, France five, Germany twenty one, Hungary two. India, India, twenty-three. Indonesia one, Ireland one, Israel ten, Italy one, Lithuania two, Mexico one. Netherlands three, New Zealand four, Portugal one, and then Russia four, Slovakia one, Spain five, Sweden one, Switzerland one, Tibet one, two, count me, <laughs> and the UK. <laughs> Sixteen UK, Ukraine two, USA eleven, Uzbekistan one. Very interesting group. <clears throat> I visited. I think all of these countries except Uzbekistan and Ukraine. Oh, maybe Indonesia also, no. Lithuania I visited, Mexico I visited, Portugal I visited, Russia many times, UK also many times, USA many times. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, <coughs> so what we are, doing here is supposed to be doing Buddhist practice. Then there is the question of whether Buddhism is a religion or not, right? Buddhism is not a religion as we normally understand. Normally religion means a practice where the central practice is faith towards a God, towards a Creator. So that way it is not religion. Because Buddhism don't believe in a Creator God. <laughs> Nihilist. <laughs> <coughs> but anyway, what is important for us to know is all these major world religious traditions
they are philosophically different. Message is more or less same. Love, compassion, helping others, same. So message is more important than philosophy. And then don't worry about the differences. Differences are not necessarily divisive. Even in you, you have a lot of differences. And you have a lot of contradictions. You have one opinion in the morning, one after lunch, right? Because of this conflicting thinking, it gives an opportunity you to, to grow. So contradiction itself is not a bad thing, right? So, so we, it's important for us to know that the message is same. Message is important. Love, compassion, and so forth. Philosophy is not so important. I mean, important in the sense for, for long-term benefit, for, for convincing understanding, different philosophical understanding may be important. But sometimes, if you just exercise dry intellectual knowledge, then it's of not much benefit, right? Right? So, now according to Buddhism, Buddhism is called Dharma, Dharm in Hindi, Sanskrit is called Dharm. Dharm has almost like 80 different types of meanings, out of which three primary meanings are, one is the path that leads to enlightenment, that's also called Dharm. So Dharm in that sense is a practice which is non-harming, non-violent. And then dharma also refers to liberation, nirvana, cessation of suffering. Right? So these are the primary meaning when we talk about doing dharma practice. Otherwise, I mean, this is also dharma. This is also dharma. I am also dharma. You are also dharma. So any object, any phenomena that holds, maintains its identity, it's called dharma. So in terms of practice, the Hindi word dharam says dharan kare to dharam. Dharan kare to dharam. That means when you keep something which is useful, then that's called dharma practice. So dharam basically means something by whose practice will help you not to fall down. For example, if you are very fond of fighting, then Dharma says, no, it's not good, your blood pressure will increase and things like that. Then you stop getting angry or fighting. That, that is how you are protected by Dharma, how you are protected from falling down. So anything that helps you, you know, not to go down, fall down, that is Dharma. The Tibetan word for Dharma is Chö. Chu. Now you should, you should know this word, Chu. You know at least one Tibetan word now. It's your Tibetan language class. Chu. Chu means transform. So I get more or less same with the Hindi word Dharma. So Chu means transform. Transform means transforming your negative mind into positive mind. If that is happening, then you are doing Dharma practice. If that is not happening, then you undergo 29 times retreat, receive 20 times Kala Chakra initiation, Guha Samaja empowerment, Yamintaka empowerment, whatever, you will remain the same stupid fellow. No transformation, no change, really. So it's not, not so much, you know, dharma, pra dharma practice is not so much for the sake of counting that I receive this many initiations from such great teachers, I attend these, these teachings, that teaching, it's not for counting. <laughs> right? It's primarily for transformation of your mind. Transformation of your mind means what we want is long-lasting happiness, as we agreed this morning. And what obstructs long-lasting happiness is negative emotions. 
So now as a Dharma practitioner, what we need to do is we need to consider ourselves as warriors, fighters. This time, not fighting against other, another human being, but fighting against the negative emotions. And also, you are not talking about fighting negative emotions that is there in other people, but it is primarily talking about your own negative emotions. Anger, jealousy, hatred, so many negative emotions are there. Right? Fighting against these negative emotions, because it is these negative emotions that is inside you that is making your life miserable. That is creating division among people, unhappiness among people, disharmony among people, right? Negative emotions. So it's very simple actually. Practice is difficult, but understanding is not so difficult. For example, do one practice. That one practice means out of all this host of negative emotions, you know, you should find out which one of these negative emotions have a predominant presence in you, in your individual case. Because the enemy is so much, you know, negative emotions are so much, you can't fight all of them together. But identify one negative emotion which has a very strong predominant presence in you and then fight against it. And reduce the strength of that negative emotion. Weaken it. If you do that, you are transforming your mind. You are doing Dharma practice. You are on the right track. We, we, when we talk about Dharma, we talk about so many different things. Yes, we can always talk. But the target of all your practice, whether you go around the temple where you recite something or prostration, whatever you do, or even when you are eating, even when you are talking, the target is whether these negative emotions are in you or not. These negative emotions are very cunning, very sly, very opportunistic. For example, if you are having some disagreement with some people, anger will come. Very cunning, opportunistic, anger will come. What happened? I will support you. Be bold. Say, say a nasty thing. Heat. It, it gives you some boldness. So therefore you, you start thinking, oh, anger is good for me. This person has been, it, to some extent it looks like you know, it's helping you. This, this particular community or person has been bullying me, exploiting me. So today I was really angry. So I was able to say things which I could not say. Do things I could not do. So anger is useful. This is what we feel. Yes, it is true. When you, when you get angry, you get an extra energy. <laughs> but that extra energy is essentially blind energy. It is unsure whether, whether you will hit the target or not. I mean, look at two people fighting, you know. They are not sure what they are doing. Oh saying all the nasty things from the mouth, they have no idea what they are saying, no idea what they are doing, they are completely crazy, insane, insanity as we say, mad. So the question is, you want to become mad? As simple as that, you want to become mad? If you want to become mad, yes, get angry. You want to become ugly? Get angry. You want to commit suicide? Get angry. You want to increase your blood pressure? Get angry. You want to lose your money, name and fame? Get angry. Even in economical terms, America loses billions of dollar in, dollars in a year because of anger. Due to anger, there is shooting, killing, mad driving, road rage, you know, lion cutting, whatever, you know. Even in terms of money. We all need money. We all need economic prosperity. Every country needs it. So we are not able to do that because of these negative emotions. Because of these negative emotions, you make division between different religions. And then, you know, the, the politicians, they take advantage of it. And then, who gets killed? Ordinary people. Right? So take one example. So, so you need to do a lot of work. Not only you, me, all of us need to do a lot of work. Just think about anger. Study Buddhism, what it says about anger. 
bring out your own life's experience. What did you get from anger? Do a research. Write a paper, an article based on your experience. That will be very, very powerful. So I am not saying it, or somebody is not saying it. You are, you are proving it through your own life's experience. And then what the scientists say, what did they find about anger? Right? We have scientific proof, personal evidence, wisdom teachings from different sources. Right? Then you also use your common sense. We all want to be a handsome person, right? Beautiful lady, right? And that's why we don ourselves, ornament ourselves, comb our hair, you know, decorate ourselves with golden earrings and, you know, lipsticks and megas and things like that. After all this decoration, then you get angry. Your eye becomes like a snake's eye, round. When you get angry, the eye becomes a little bit round. When you don't study, then your eye becomes like the eye of a ship, stupid. Right? So, so you will not become a handsome person. You wear the best suit, best cloth, most expensive cloth. If you want to get a good girlfriend, if you're angry all the time, she will run away from you. Right? As similar as that. I mean, we can go deeper. This is much more than <laughs> dealing with those things. But even in our day-to-day -day life, you see, family members can't live harmoniously, enjoy the food because of anger. And as I said, the worst thing is when you get angry, it destroys your capacity to judge what is right, what is wrong. You become mad, you become insane. All this conflict that we are seeing is insanity, madness. Right? So think like that. With this kind of understanding, knowledge, that anger is not good for health. You know? And I've always been saying that there's nobody who right in the morning makes a motivation saying that today I'll get angry. Is, is there anybody who makes planning, today I'll get angry? No, because you have some idea that anger is not good. But in the course of the day, <laughs> you meet strange people, you know, then, then, then you get angry, you fight, and uh, then at the close of the day, when you look back and uh, realize that you fought with somebody, that you got angry, is there anybody who says that today I was very angry, fought with somebody, so I really enjoyed the day. Nobody there. So when you get really angry, you become insane. So that's why I'm, I'm sometimes scared. These days, insane leaders have all the nuclear bombs and ballistic missiles <laughs> under their control. Insanity, really. So we need to educate people. Big education is needed. Not the classroom type of education. But, but education of drawing out the inner resources and capacities that you have and how to use it to bring harmony and peace in the world or th throughout the planet towards all sanity. That, that is not easy, but it's feasible. If we, we all make the effort, when you know you have so people from so many countries, you go, go back and share this. You don't have to sit on a high throne or anything like that, but share this as a researcher. Discuss about this. Right? I have some, some few friends, some of them just listened to teaching and then went back and they're doing a wonderful job in their own area. This is not spreading Buddhism. <laughs> this is using our common sense and, uh, you know, keeping within us what is really important and throwing all the garbages. Throwing all the garbages. So therefore, you need to realize that you have obtained a very precious human life today. Very precious human life. And according to Buddhist teaching, it says it is not easy to get it again and again. 
Don't take it for granted. It's not the case. At least according to Buddhist teaching, it is not that when you, you are born as a human being, the next time also you are a human being. No. <coughs> next time you may be Buddha, or you may be a dog, or you may be a cockroach. Depending upon what karma <laughs> you committed, you see. You can go better, you can go worse, go down. That's why we have hell and heaven. The hell and heaven not necessarily a physical place somewhere. It is in your mind. It is how what you experience. Even in this life, before you die, if you keep on developing all the negative emotions, you will experience hell. I'm living in hell. That's what we say normally. And when you have the right approach, right attitude, there is a peace, there is harmony, there is happiness. You, you have a kind of heaven there. So we need to build that heaven on this earth right now. We can have the comfort of talking about nirvan, enlightenment, but these are very, very distant goals. Not many people are practicing, so <laughs> there's not much hope. <laughs> Honestly speaking, it's not easy. Completely getting rid of negative emotions. Completely removing the seed of negative emotions. Completely removing the imprints of negative emotions. These are all taught in, in the text, but not many people who practice rigorously day and night, so not many people will be able to do that. But at least we can lessen the intensity of these negative emotions and make our life much more happier and healthier. So that way, your next life will be better. So if you are a good, sincere practitioner, then you need to make a plan that in this life also, not, not postpone for next life, in this life also I will you know, reduce my negative emotions and uh, the rest of the days and months and years of my life will be much, much happier. And through that way, you make a plan and do practice so that next life also you are born as a human being and you have access to all these spiritual teachings so you become better better, 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 than enlightenment. So there we need to make a, you know, a great planning. And not only planning, but then trade on the path, practice it. And then the good news, good news with the mind is, if you make an effort, you can change it, you can transform it. And once you, are, once you transform the mind, that transformation of the mind is much more reliable and sure than the transformation of the body. With your physical body, you know, you want to become an Olympian and you give as much training as you can, right? And then you become the number one world's gold medalist in long jump or you know, boxing or whatever, right? Or swimming, right? So you may be the, the world's number one in gold, gold world, world's number one gold medalist in long jump. Still, you do some practice. You may be able to, you know, do a little bit better, but it will never come that because of your practice now you are jumping from one mountain to another mountain. That's not possible because the basis on which you are giving the training is body, material, physical. So that's why in, a, in terms of development also, development of the country also, I was saying that we should have some contentment. Now, contrary to that, when it comes to the development of the mind, the basis on which you are giving, giving the training is the mind, which is a pure energy. So you can develop it to limitless quality. Take the example of the, some of the best minds in the world. His Holiness the Dalai Lama or uh, Albert Einstein. Einstein never said, I practice so much, I knew so much, and there's no room for me for further development. In fact, he said, I'm unable to use my brain more than five, six percent. And he said, if I'm able to use at least 11 percent of my brain, I can create all kinds of miracles. This is not a statement from a Buddhist practitioner, this is from Einstein. And he said, with my limited effort, I gained some insight and knowledge in science and mathematics. Even with this limit, limited knowledge, people almost pray to me. They look towards me with amazement. Einstein. Oh. 
See, this is, this is a great encouragement, you see. If we make an effort, we can do miracles. And the miracles means here not flying. Flying is important, maybe useful, but birds have been flying since ages. <laughs> Human beings fly, then we say, oh, if we are able to fly, okay, I don't know how good it is. Birds have been flying. Then swimming, you get gold medal in swimming, but birds, the fishes, fish have been swimming for ages. They are much, much better. All the gold medals should go to the fish. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not, again, trying to be, you know, cynical. But what I'm saying is, it's good that you make some progress development in these areas, but these are, I think, not the real area where we should, as human beings, excel. We should excel, excel in terms of development of loving kindness, in compassion. You should be a gold medalist in compassion. His Holiness should get the gold medal. Mother Teresa should get the gold medal. Why, why are we not getting gold medal for these people? <laughs> See, we, we, we clearly showing that your aspiration is towards material, physical things, seeable things, right? And then with, with these clothes, oh, this is branded. All these teachings by Buddha are branded. Compassion is branded. Lo loving kindness is branded. They are produced in the factory of Buddha himself. <laughs> and we are not regarding them as branded qualities. We are simply saying, oh, it is good if you have compassion. And many people might say, oh, today compassion has no place. So this is our attitude. So we need to realize the importance of these inner qualities. Reducing negative emotions. On the very day, very time, when you reduce some of your negative emotions, you will be much, much better. There are cases of many people who physically got themselves healed through practice without meditation, without medication. Such is the power of the mind. If we sincerely practice, practice with dedication. Dedication has to be there. Half-hearted practice will not lead to anywhere. It's a full force of energy. Therefore, we talk about concentration. Now, now, today, concentration is very difficult. There's so many distractions everywhere. So many. Idarao, idarao, idarao. Bulova, harjaga, Right? So, it's important to con concentrate. It's important to concentrate because if you, if you get distracted, it means you are wondering, you are chasing the sensual objects, and you will get obsessed with the sensual objects, and then your earlier commitment, that I want long-lasting happiness, and I will work for that, is defeated. You will not get it. Right? So therefore, it is really important for you to do some research, not only listen to me or any teacher, you can listen, but not just that. Do yourself research about anger. Be honest with anger. Give all the plus point, also the minus point. Goodness of anger, badness of anger, right? Everything. Be, be honest, be fair. If you find that anger is getting more number and winning, then practice anger. Get angry all the time. Once I was giving a talk to a group of 60, 70 Iranian business people who came to Dharamsala. And uh, one of my acquaintances from Bombay recommended, perhaps recommended me. So they invited me to give a talk. I give a half day talk and then followed by question answers. Then during question and answer, there was a gentleman who said, your talk is very good, but I'm very angry, man. But I'm very angry, man. And somebody says something, I'll not just sit there talking. I'll immediately pummel him down. I'll, I'll use my fist. 
So what do you say? I said, go, go continue. <laughs> continue. Very soon you will see the result. <laughs> so this is negative emotions, you know, if you give credit to this, this negative emotions, you do it for some time. You will understand. This is not good for me. I've, I've met a number of people, senior people, educated people, business people, you know, reaching the same limit. Right? So therefore, how bad is anger? How bad is jealousy? How bad is attachment? How bad is negative competition? How bad is arrogance? All this you should. This is a kind of psychology, you see. So study all this. For example, arrogance, you know, you become arrogant because of power, because of money, you go like this. Your head high up in the sky. Then we say pride goes before a fall. <laughs> when you go like this, you will fall. You will trip. <laughs> right? And you will never think about learning from other people. Because you think, I know, yeah, I know, I know, yeah, yeah, I know. You know nothing, but you say, I know, I know. People who know, they say, I know nothing. So it clouds your mind. You are unable to see the goodness. So, so be humble. The Buddhist teachers, they say, practice humility. When you remain humble, when you remain receptive, then you, you, your, the, your, the door of your mind is open to receive all the blessings, all the teachings, all the wisdoms. And they give the example. He, the, the, in one of the texts, it says, humility is very important. Arrogance is very destructive. And as an example, the text says, you should yourself see where the beautiful green grasses and flowers grow more down in the valley or more on the exposed top of a mountain. On the exposed top of a mountain, there's hardly any green grass or flower, maybe a little bit. But down in the valley, it's full of green grass, flowers, things like that. When you're arrogant, it's like an arrogant person climbing a, a branchless tall tree. When he climbs that branch, less tall tree, he feels very proud because others are not able to climb. He says, look how high I am. But he doesn't realize the risk of falling down. <laughs> the higher you climb, the greater is the risk to fall down. So, so it is important to, to be humble and receptive and listen. Listen more. We have two ears. See more, two eyes, only one mouth, speak less. Our physical features also show. If you look at the physical features, two eyes means see the truth by yourself, not just listen to people. Hear the truth by yourself, not just listen to other people. Hear, in fact, eyes, this, ears to this direction, so listen to all the directions. <laughs> and then the nose, the nostrils are down, right? She says, you're not like a pig. Pig has to scavenge, so therefore noses are stayed outside. Your, your nose, nose, nostrils are down. It means it's none of your business to smell the smell of other people. Just, just see whether you are smelly or not. It's down towards you. <laughs> and then the tongue is just deep inside the mouth. It means it's none of your business to come out, you know, when the food comes in, you test it and tell me good or bad, you know, things like that. If you really look carefully, everything is a purpose. So as I started by saying that, find out about your features, very important features, your qualities, right? That's important. So therefore, the, the, the main thing that I was saying was, Dharma means, Chu means transforming your mind from negative to the positive. So reduce your negative emotions. Right? Anger, jealousy, hatred, attachment, divisiveness, all these destructive things. Okay? So now the text that we are reading this time is called 
the three principal aspects of the path. This is a very important teaching by Tsongkhapa. <coughs> Have you heard about this person, Tsongkhapa? He is the founder of uh, uh, the Gelugpa school of Tibetan Buddhism. Great teacher who had studied from all the great teachers living at his time and underwent a lot of hardships, ascetic practices, remaining alone, going retreat, you know. His, his biographies are like thick like this. So, very, very uh, great practitioner and uh, highly, highly learned and scholar. I've read some of his compositions, you know. In those days, the idea of research, research as we have today is not there. But if you read his books, you will see he is the best researcher you will see, even in today's terms. Because in today's time, I'm not again like saying everybody is stupid or things like that, but what I'm saying is in today, in many cases, research means copying. If you copy from one book, it is plagiarism. If you copy from many books, it is research. Right? So, so, from that point of view, if you read Tsongkhapa's book, he's not just copying from everywhere, he's just doing thorough research and then comes up with his own explanation. This is what I, you know, researched and this is what I found. And the great uniqueness of this teacher is, on the same, same text, one particular text, there are many commentaries, commentaries by him, commentaries by other teachers, famous teachers. In the case of many other famous teachers, with due respect, many other teachers, when it becomes a naughty, difficult problem, all these so-called great teachers have very few explanations. Because they are not able to <laughs> unknot the knot. <laughs> Now Tsongkhapa would make it a point that he will leave it completely clear. On easier points, he will not talk much. That is uniqueness of Tsongkhapa. He has 18 huge volumes. And luckily many of these texts are now available in English also. Right? For example, he's uh, now available in English, three, two volumes, uh, three, two volumes, yeah, three volumes of Lamrim Chemo. Three volumes, right? Great stages of the path. Great stages of the spiritual path. How to find the teacher and until how you become enlightened. Three volumes available in English right you now. And then there are shorter versions, shorter versions of the same thing. Like this is summarized into three aspects, which is also the essence of all those commentaries. Right? And then this this teaching on the three principal aspects of the path, it is said that Tsongkhapa got this teaching directly from Manjushri. You have idea about Manjushri? This is all like fairy tale, you know. <laughs> Manjushri is said, said to be not a human being, but a celestial being, a kind of God. Right? He is called the deity of wisdom. Right? So he, in the initial stage, even Tsongkhapa could not see him directly. He 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 had to use a uh, translator, Lama Umaba. Then gradually, when he became more and more purified in terms of spiritual practice, then he was able to receive direct teachings from him. So it is for us; it's not easy to trust all these things. But these are all recorded. You see, all the teachings are recorded. All the explanations are recorded. You see, so here you need to know two things. Now I, I tell you, I'm not going deep into those things, which, which where you have no idea. Now, now here you need to understand this Buddhist process of practice, where you will find four methods of explanation of the Buddhist philosophy. The first is. The observ observable, observable things, which is called obvious phenomena. There is an object, obvious phenomena, observe, which you can observe, observable objects. That is, that, that is presented in Buddhist text. Then second, the subject of mind. Third, how this subject of mind 
comprehends, understands this object, the phenomena. The fourth, in order to precisely know that object, how reason is used, how logic is used. So through this four-fold process of study, we, the Buddhist philosophy is explained. It is very important. Now with regard to the first object, the observable object, again this can be get, categorized into three. One is what we call as obvious manifest phenomena, which you can see, like you are, you are op, 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 manifest phenomena. This computer is a manifest phenomena. So all those obvious phenomena, where you can use your senses, your eye can see it, ear can hear it, those are observable phenomena. In this area, you should not depend on other people much. You should go and see it for yourself to find the truth. For example, if, if you wanted to know about Apple, don't ask me about Apple. Don't ask me give an explanation or teaching on Apple. You should go yourself to the, the fruit, fruit shop and see the apple itself, cut it and see it. That's the end of the story. This is the scientific way, scientific way. So sometimes in the philosophy, in Buddhist philosophy also, sometimes they explain obvious phenomena with the logic and reason. For me, that doesn't make much sense. It's a little bit outdated. So in the observ observable area, you should go for yourself and find the truth by yourself. Don't rely upon other people. Even here, the problem is normally we don't do this task of finding the things by ourselves. We simply listen to us other person, then spread the gossip, spread the rumor, right? Even Aristotle did it. He's a very famous philosopher, right? Even Aristotle, <laughs> he said, women have less teeth than men. Is that true? No, same, I think same. Same, because he said this because he must have heard this from some other people. And he did not experiment it by himself, although he married two times. He could have easily <laughs> told one of his wife to open the mouth and count the teeth. That's the end of the story, you see. So this, even this area is very important. In those observable areas, don't just listen to other people. Un unless you have a jaundiced eye, then probably you have to ask <laughs> other people. And you have a disease, something. Otherwise, find it for yourself. That will stop rumor mongering, gossiping, many of these things, bad element that is spreading in the society can be stopped, right? Then the second is called slightly hidden phenomena, which means you can't observe those things with your senses directly, but you, need, you can use reason and infer it, find it out, right? Now, for example, tomorrow morning when I at, at, at 10 o'clock, around 10 o'clock, when the door opens and what you will first see is the end of this rope. Yes, and when you see this, you'll, you will figure out, oh, Geshila is coming. This rope is not Geshila, <laughs> right? But through this, you can infer that Geshila is coming. Or normally we say, if you see smoke on the far distant Toba mountain, you see smoke, then you can infer, oh, there, there, there is a fire, or oh, there are some people there, you can infer. So those that you can't directly see, still you can use logic, reason, and find out. So here you should again use your logic, reason, valid logic, not wrong logic, <laughs> valid logic. Then third level is what is known as completely hidden phenomena which you neither can see directly, nor you, nor you can directly reason out, but you need to listen to somebody. Like many of these teachings of the Buddha, they, that's what I'm saying. Many of these teachings of the Buddha, the Manjushri and all those things that I said, you may not be able to understand right now, but you have to listen to the Buddha. The re reason that you listen to the Buddha is in all those areas, the obvious phenomena, the sl slightly hidden phenomena, and, and, and all those areas where you can use your judgment and, and, and uh, uh, brain and intelligence, 
you found all Buddha's teaching authentic, reliable. And there is no reason for the Buddha to cheat you or deceive you or exploit you. So therefore, this area where I can't figure things out directly should be correct. Just like your birthday. When somebody asks you when you were born, you say 15 August 1956. How did you figure out? Did you see it? No. Did you reason it? Infer it? No. How do you know? My parents told me. How can you trust your parents? Because my parents love me. They are not going to get anything by telling my birthday wrong. So indirectly, you use the reason why you should trust them. Directly, you can't use that reason. So there are three levels, right? So in all these levels, now the mind has to engage with all these objects and understand all these objects, right? So you need to know the nature of these different types of objects. You need to, more importantly, you need to know all these different types of subjective mind, the negative emotions, the compassion, the wisdom, the you know, all these different types of mind, emotions. And once you study and understand all these emotions, you will be able to find which out which of these emotions are useful, which of these emotions are negative. That's why we make a distinction between positive emotions and negative emotions. Constructive emotions, destructive emotions. And once through this rigorous study you are able to clearly see the goodness of these positive emotions, you, will, you should cherish it, nurture it, cultivate it, make it part of your life. When you know in detail the ne destructive negative emotions, afflictive emotions, then you should see their destructiveness and lessen it and gradually try to completely eliminate it. And then gradually it is said not only you remove the negative emotions but also the seed of these negative emotions. And when you remove the seeds of the negative emotions then you get liberated, you achieve nirvana. Still some imprints are left. So you need to remove those imprints also. When you remove the imprints also, then you get completely enlightened, you become Buddha. So that's the process. Anyway, this is a long story, but what is important is, as I already mentioned, find out that one negative emotion which has been bothering you much. Find out about that one addiction which has been destroying your life or disturbing your life. And by seeing the destructiveness of this negative emotion, reduce its intensity. You will be happier and happier and happier. Now today, many people, especially in the modern world, are suffering from this uh, stress, depression, things like that. These are all because of attachment and fear. Fear comes because of attachment. If there's no attachment, why should you have fear? When you, have, when, they, when, you, when you don't worry about losing something, why should you have fear? When you have attachment, then you have this fear. For example, you fear death, means you have attachment. If you have no attachment to your life, why should you fear? Right, so this, this process of, Buddhism has a very rich psychology, very rich and deep psychology. How to, how to somebody, as I remember once reading a book where one gentleman, I think scientist who says, the Buddha, Buddha is the greatest scientist the world has seen so far. Because he came out with an idea of how to completely remove the negative emotions from the root. No scientist has ever spoke even about that, forget about finding the method. But again, unfortunately, today when we talk about science, scientists, we talk about those people who have instruments and who wear a white jacket, whatever, you know, <laughs> work in the laboratory. But we don't give a damn to people who work in the laboratory of the mind. For the Buddhist practitioners, your laboratory is with you right from the birth, your brain. Which is, which is source of all other laboratories. Which is source of all other creations that you have created. It comes from here. But this headquarter itself is completely neglected, right? So therefore study about human mind, study about 
how emotions function. Study about brain, right? Then if you do a comparative study of how brains function according to the scientific explanation and how the mind functions according to Buddhist explanation, you'll, you'll more or less come, come on the same point. Based on my little reading, they are pointing to the same thing. For example, meditation. In Buddhism, we talk about meditation, which means making your mind habituated with something again and again, repeatedly doing it. According to the brain scientist, you know, the, whether you will develop positive emotions or negative emotions dependent upon what kind of brain connections you are going to make. Those areas of brain where, where, you, where you constantly do good things, then that areas of the brain where there is better connection of these positive things, it will continuously do that. For example, after the birth, the child is not even able to speak because connection is not made. And when gradually the connections are met, the child is able to speak and even sing a song, things like that. So similarly, we have to make this good connection, not the bad connection. This now scientifically we can find that out. It's not just Buddhist teachers talking about it. So, the thing is, as one Tibetan teacher says, there is nobody who will catch hold of your hand and throw you into heaven. Meaning, <laughs> your best friends, even Buddha, cannot do this. There's nobody who will catch hold of your hand and throw you into heaven. Similarly, there is nobody who will catch hold of your leg and drag you into hell. The so-called your enemies can't do that. The Chinese leaders couldn't do that with the Tibetans. They physically torture it, but mentally they have no control. So the inner resources become so useful. We have examples of so many Tibetan prison, you know, uh, prisoners. Some of them were in prison for 20 years, 17 years, 16 years. And I know one monk who was in Chinese prison for 17 years was from Namjal Monastery, and he knew his holiness, but unfortunately he could not escape, so he was imprisoned. And then later on he was, after 17 years in prison, he was able to come to India, and he was, uh, he has a bent bag, and uh, I was helping him go to the hospital a few times. Then one time his holiness called him, and they were talking, and he always said, well, you, you remained in Chinese prison for many years. Did you face some problem, some threat? He said, yes, on few occasions I face, faced some problem. He always thought, must be problem or threat of his life. He said, is that so? He said, no, 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 no. It is the danger of losing compassion for the Chinese torturers. Danger of forgetting compassion, imagine. Because they're, they're, the more they torture, it becomes intolerable, right? So you see, might, might be, you know, losing compassion, you know, danger of losing compassion or getting angry. So he thought, this is a great, great risk and danger in my practice, you know. These are, they are torturing me. Right now I am physically suffering, but in the long run they will suffer more than me. So he was feeling love and compassion for them. 17 years. And the end result is, even after 17 years in prison, I met not only one, but many Tibetans. You, if you listen to their story, I had interviewed some of them. We have re recordings of those talks and teachings. Unbelievable, the, the resilience. Many foreign journalists who interviewed them, they couldn't believe their eyes. You remained in Chinese prison for 16 years, 17 years. Still you seem to be <laughs> intact. <laughs> this is because of practice. Because at the end of the day, nobody can help you. Your friends will go, enemies will go, relatives will go. This is exactly what Shanti Deva says. Zawa Namja Major Shing. Friends will go. Miza Namja Major Shing. Enemies will go. 
I will also go. And not only that, even in this life, we have all seen how many people are dying, how many people are living. So at the end of the day, you will have to take this journey along. So better you prepare right now. And that will help you not only at the time of death, even now. Even now, many people are suffering from loneliness. And that loneliness is not so much about physical isolation. That loneliness is mental loneliness. The people who are suffering from loneliness in a city of 20, 30 millions. And there are meditators high, sitting high up in the mountain who remain alone and practice for the rest of their life. They never suffer from loneliness. Right? So, the today, not only today, earlier also, the great Kadamba teachers mentioned this. The problem with us human beings is we don't know how to live alone and also don't know how to live with others. I mean, this, these are gold mine. This wisdom teachings are gold mine. We don't know how to live alone and don't know how to live with others. If you don't know how to live with others, then live alone. If you don't know how to live alone, then live with, with others, with love, with compassion, with harmony. So we are, we are not good. Then, if you don't know how to live alone, how to live with others, then of course depression will come. Loneliness will come. All these other <laughs> low self-esteem will come. All other problems will come. And these meditators who meditate high in the mountain, they are physically alone in solitude, but mentally they are praying for everybody, thinking about everybody, you see. So love is not how many times you touch each other. It is how many times you reach each other. Mentally how you reach each other. Remember them in your prayers. Think about them. That is, at, at least, for example, if a big conflict is going on in some other parts of the world, the people are dying, there's nothing much we can directly do, but at least we can mentally be with them and pray for them, you see. Right? That's why Martin Luther King said, I don't feel sad when bad people do bad things. I feel sad when good people don't do anything. <laughs> so we need to be more active and make our presence felt so that the society has no room for bad people. You see? If it looks like you are the only person trying to do good things, nobody is coming out supporting, it will be very difficult for you. If we make all our presence felt, nobody will dare to do bad things. Right? So, our enemy, not only enemy, our enemy number one is the negative emotions, not the people. Not the people. <laughs> Therefore, one, in one teaching it says, in one sense, in one sense, <laughs> dogs are more clever than human beings. <laughs> because if you throw a stone to a dog, the dog will first chase the stone, then probably come to the person who threw the stone. But human beings don't do that. If I hit you a stick, you will immediately jump upon me, not after the stick. Right? And then we will try to justify it, saying, yeah, 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 dogs are stupid, you know. The, the, the stone did not fly by itself, did not come by itself. It's the human being who threw it. It's the human being who used the stick. Therefore, I, I'm after him. So we try to justify it. But then Shantideva says, if, you're, if you think you are really clever, then if you really want to go to the root, then also don't go to the human being, but go to the negative emotions inside that human being, which, ne which made that person helpless, got angry, and uh, seized by anger, he threw the stone and the stick. And look here, you neither go to the stick, which directly hit you, nor go to the source, which is the afflict emotion, you, ca you are catching somebody in between. <laughs> right? 
So the point is, when negative, there is when there is a strong presence of negative emotions, you should feel sorry for these people because they are helpless. Nobody wants to get angry, but the anger comes. Nobody wants to double attachment, but attachment comes because of situation, circumstances, and things like that. So when you see this, if you read this very famous book called 400 Verses by Arya Deva, one of my fav favorite texts. So there, there, there he, he says, when a sick person goes to the physician, doctor, the doctor or physician, if, of course, I mean, these days, again, doctors and physicians are questionable, but in the case of the, the good physician and doctor, he would have sympathy and concern for that sick person. Even if that sick person misbehaves, he will or she will understand it and give the best treatment. So similarly, the Buddhas see negative emotions as the enemy, not the person who has the negative emotions. So it's the presence of these negative emotions that is bringing all these unfortunate happenings in the world, including conflict and killing, all these things. Because you are mad, you are crazy, you are insane. Like anger. Then with attachment, because of attachment and greed, we are destroying the whole planet. I want more, more, more. <laughs> and this, this is there because ignorance. Anger, attachment, all these negative emotions there because of ignorance. You don't know the reality. You misperceive the reality. And because of this, you end up developing all these neg negative emotions. So therefore, through study, through reflection, remove your ignorance, lessen your ignorance. Then you will be able to see how closely we are connected to each other. How closely we are connected to the, the, the earth, the environment in which we live. The medicine you take comes from the earth. Imagine if you pollute the earth, how are you going to get pure medicine? If you pollute the earth, how are you going to get pure water, pure air? As simple as that. In the Tibetan medi medical system, it is said, you get sick, you become sick when your four elements are imbalanced. And you take medicine to balance it. Now imagine if that, that medicine, that pill, which is prepared from polluted, contaminated environment, it will have no effect to balance the imbalanced elements. So it's really like a question of life and death. <laughs> right? So therefore it is important to gain more knowledge about death, about impermanence, about interconnected reality, about the sameness, right? Sameness. Then there is no room for discrimination. And these different names, Islam, Buddhism, black, white, these are designations. For example, I call this, what do I call this one? Eyeglass. Why don't I call it snake? I'm, I'm not going to wear my snake. <laughs> now it looks funny, right? Right in the beginning, instead of calling this glass, eye glass, if somebody had given the name snake, today you will not laugh at me. I can easily say I'm going to wear my snake. <laughs> These are all designations. And designations are useful for communication. That's it. So don't take it for granted, whatever you designated is something that is really like established deep down in the ground, so you can't change it. Black means black, horrible means horrible, nobody can change it, no. Just designation. Why you should be carried so much after designation? Designation, for example, we all have very good name, good designation. Everybody has a good name, right? So that doesn't mean that you are that actually, actually, you know, matching the name, <laughs> right? 
So don't don't be carried away by just designations. Understand the reality properly to remove these negative emotions. So therefore, out of these three principal aspects of the path, the first is renunciation, right? Now here, of course, we'll discuss tomorrow also. Renunciation basically means you see the shortcomings, you see the limitations of whatever is there within this cycle of existence, whatever is there within the samsara, right? The limitations, the shortcomings, the faults, insufficiencies, whatever you call it. So now, for example, if, if we take the example of human being itself, Nagarjuna's letter to the friend says, human beings are in the true sense of the term, not well at all. Human beings in the true sense of the term are not well at all. They are, they are not well at all, number one. Not well at all, number two. Impermanent. Impure and selfless four categories, not well at all. That means, of course, not well at all because look at how we started our life. When you are in the womb, it's a very beautiful description of how much the child suffers when it is in the womb of the mother, completely enclosed within that pulp or whatever you call it, and no, no light, nothing. And if the mother is not careful, she takes hot soup or hot water, it hurts the child, things like that, a lot of description there. Then finally, when the child takes the birth, the first thing that the child does is crying, not laughing, not smiling, right? First thing that the child does is crying. And by crying, the child is asking for something. That is the child's only language. And what do you think the child is asking? The child is not asking for a lengthy discourse on Buddhism <laughs> or, thereby, or thereby any religion. This is very significant and important. The child is asking for somebody's love. That love also, not the business love that we develop as grown-up people, but unconditional love. Because the unconditional love, because that helpless child has nothing to give back. The child has no hair, no hair, no teeth, no cloth, forget about money. Forget about speaking two, three languages, not even one language, the only language is that crying. Very vulnerable. And that human child is actually much more vulnerable than the young ones of animals. Young ones of some animals, immediately after the birth, after a few seconds, few minutes, they, 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 they start walking. Right? Walking. Human beings, human children, child, for six months, they are not even, the, the child is not even able to lift the head. Crawling, still not able to lift the head. Then next two years, not able to walk properly. Very vulnerable. At that very difficult, vulnerable, fragile time, it is the mother's unconditional love primarily mother, others may be there, but primarily mother's unconditional love, that made the child not only survive, but flourish. So remember this. Our life started by this unconditional love, but as we grow up, we forget this unconditional love. And the little bit of love that we develop, especially between boys and girls, is business love. You love me so long as I love you. There's business. 
What is being taught in Buddhism is unconditional love. You love other people because they are exactly like you. They want ha happiness. They don't want suffering. You also want happiness. Don't want suffering. So with this realization, we should show this unconditional love, which we are unable to do. And we, we, we pay more attention to the secondary and the tertiary issues, which religion you belong to, <laughs> from which country you came from. I mean, you can ask these questions, but not with a divisive mind, right? Forget the sameness. We all came crying. We all survived by this unconditional love. We forget this. Now it is high time we go to the basic and remember those days. What had helped you when you were in that difficult situation, state? It was this unconditional care and love. That's what we need in the society today also. And the love, unconditional love is something, you know, something that the deaf can hear and the blind can see. And the love minimizes fault. When you have this general love, you don't highlight weakness and shortcomings of other people. You highlight their good qualities. You see beautiful things in other people. You don't judge them by the, the look of the face and the hairstyle or clothing and things like that. I mean, it's a miracle. That's why I was saying that you can, we can all, as I quoted Einstein saying that, you know, if you have more knowledge, you can create miracles. That means if you reduce the intensity of these negative emotions a little bit, you are creating miracles. If you used to be very, very hot-tempered, angry person, now that anger is gone. You have, you have done miracles. That's a real miracle. Being able to fly is nothing. Right? So therefore, today we, we did discuss many things. But some of this you should remember. One, explore more about what it means to be a human being. Explore. This is your homework. Not necessarily today, this time. But do this a little bit more research. What it means to be a human being. What are the main sources of long-lasting happiness? Right? And then reducing the negative emotions with the realization that our negative emotions are our enemy number one. Negative emotions are our enemy number one, but unfortunately that those negative emotions have already captured the headquarters of our mind. They're already captured. I'm not saying we are embodiment of all the bad things, have no good qualities. We do have good qualities, but I'm saying that the negative emotions have an upper hand in our daily life, in our daily decisions. Especially the two, the bosses of the negative emotions. Which are which are which can be like president and prime minister. Ignorance, root cause of all the sufferings and problems, and self cherishing attitude, thinking just about oneself and not about others. These two are residing in our headquarters, and they are resting peacefully because nobody is challenging, nobody is doing dharma practice, <laughs> nobody is talking about bodhicitta, nobody is talking or practicing, not only talking but nobody is you know, very sincerely practicing bodhicitta, emptiness and so forth. So nobody's challenging. They got a landslide majority in their election. So now they have captured the headquarters of their mind and resting peacefully. So now, as somebody who is interested in the Dharma, our job is to enthrone the leaders and the host of other positive emotions, enthrone them and dethrone the negative emotions, especially the leaders, ignorance and self-cherishing. That is our job. 
So there's no need for us to read the three principal aspects of the path and <laughs> spend five, six days. <laughs> Honestly speaking, I mean, I'm not saying I'll not come, we'll do. Because this is an old way of doing things, you know. I, I, I practiced, the, I attended the six days here. And all these things are, you know, daily kind of things that the organization has to do or we have to do something like that. But what I'm saying is, you should catch the heart, what needs to be done. And unless we individually do it, nobody can do it for us. That's why we have the word individual. Individual means the individual part of the, the world, the whole. So don't say we can't change the world because you are individual part of that big world. Sometimes people almost kind of discourage us by saying, oh, the, there's nothing much we can do. We are in just a cog in the big giant wheel which is moving. And we are just a tiny cog in the wheel. I said, maybe you're a tiny cog, but don't cooperate, just come out. <laughs> yeah, really. So, so we should always have, you know, then, then, as I always say, think globally, act locally. Yes, to, to some extent is right, you can't, you or me, I'm not president, prime minister, even president, prime minister can't change things easily. So we can't change things overnight. So that's why I say, think globally in the form of prayer, in the form of solidarity. Talk about it, think about it, what is right, what is wrong, right? Don't just side with some other country or things like that because of your likes and dislikes, but honestly, who is, who is wrong, who is right? If there is a need to talk, talk about that, support that. Act locally means that is more difficult. Talking about world peace is easy. Oh, if the world peace, you know, ah, non-violence, yeah, it's easy. The problem is the next door neighbor. <laughs> Sometimes they say, talking about world peace is easy. The, the problem is the, uh, <laughs> the, the miserable next door neighbor. <laughs> And not only never, but your family members. <laughs> you know, we, even with your family members, we may not be that nice, honestly speaking. You see? Husband and wife, before they are married, they, are, they look very nice. Especially during the honeymoon, they're very nice. Ah. <laughs> without you, I can't live. And without me, you can't live. And then chase each other. That's what we see in the Indian movies, huh? chasing each other. Right? And then after the honeymoon period is over, spend some time together, and then even the questions are not answered properly. You know, when some, somebody calls from outside, you still look so nice. Oh, hello, how are you? But when your husband is calling you, wife is calling you, <laughs> the response is also not that good. Familiarity breeds contempt, as we say. You see, this is our human nature. But it's important to learn to live nicely with those people with whom you work, with whom you live. Then, very easy to talk about world peace. Okay. So, negative emotions are our enemy number one. So, our job as a practitioner, spiritual practitioner, is to dethrone and weaken the negative emotions. And enthrone and empower the positive emotions, especially bodhicitta and wisdom understanding shunyata. Okay? The antidote to ignorance is wisdom that sees the way things are. The antidote to negative self-cherishing attitude is bodhicitta, the altruistic mind to enlightenment. And these days, you know, you, you will hear His Holiness teach on the 19th and 20th morning. I'm pretty sure what he is going to teach. He is now based on his many lives and this life's experience. He is just now summarizing it. He will not speak much as he used to before. He will say, practice bodhicitta. Practice, develop wisdom, understanding, emptiness. And he says it so powerfully that he now clearly says, I've realized emptiness. 
I've developed the bodhicitta. You see, he's not just saying, oh, you can one day have it. Not like me. <laughs> he's practiced it. And with confidence, he's saying that. And he says, if you develop this, your life will be filled with happiness. And uh, one, one of his uh, secretaries told me that during the last two, three years, you know, his holiness, to him, is, looks, he is so happy. That's not usual with old age, you see. Yeah. When you become old, you are not able to do many things that you used to do. People become miserable, you see. But instead, the secretary found his holiness during the last two, three years. He's, of course, he's normally a happy person, but last two, three years, he's even more happier. So it's a state of mind, you see. We can all have that. And never try to harm other people, never try to cheat other people, you know, always be, try to benefit. Benefit means not just giving money. It is a kind of smile, it is extending a helping hand, you know. You can always, you see. This is how we create a peaceful society. If everybody is shouting, everybody is nasty, <laughs> how, can, how can you have peaceful society, you see? If everybody extends, uh, you know, uh, lends their air and uh, extends their helping hand and things like that, society will naturally be calm and quiet and harmonious. Right? So we need to set that example everywhere. Right? Okay. Some questions. Not questions. If you have observations also, please. Oh. Hey. Um, here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Where are you? Oh, here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question about the negative emotion. Yeah. And about your view. Mm. Um, connect the way, like, now in this time people see it more like about traumatized. Huh? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm a bit nervous to speak for all the group. Um, in a form of uh, traumatized. Like, today uh, more and more people see, like... Uh, like when someone have a lot of anger, yeah. So it's mean like you have like a really intense experience, and this is the way the system learn how to protect himself. Mm -hmm. So in this view, it's like I can say, this is some kind of act of of compassion of the body do to himself, or the only way the body know how to act. Um, and more than this, today people see more and more. I'm not sure if it's completely the true, but this is the research. Like it's come from the body, from different area in the body. The traumata is stuck, not from just the brain. And I would love to hear your opinion about this, or how it looks from the Buddhist view. One thing that is difficult for people to make distinction is that you can become very strong without getting angry. Because people think that if you have to be strong, you, you, get, you should get angry. <laughs> no. <laughs> and because of this misconception, people tend to think non-violence is a sign of weakness. Compassion is a sign of weakness. No. Violence and anger, they are really a sign of weakness. At the time of the Buddha, Somebody asked the Buddha, why when two people fight, they are standing close towards each other. When they are fighting, they are standing very close, near. But still when, when they are fighting, they are shouting at the top of their voice, voice. Why they have to shout like this? Because they are sitting next to each other. And the Buddha said, yes, physically they are close, but mentally already they have distanced themselves. So they shout. So you will never see a person fighting and saying, last time also you did this to me. <laughs> <laughs> enough is enough. Nobody say like that. <laughs> right? So, 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 so what I'm saying is, if you want to, anger, is, anger has always been 
always been compared to a conflagration of fire. How can you extinguish the fire? You cannot extinguish the fire by putting more fuel. If you put more wood, more fuel, the fire will become bigger. So similarly, that other person is angry, you are also angry. You are igniting that fire, becoming, making it become bigger. So what you need to do is withdraw the fuel, lessen the fuel, or maybe pour water on it. <laughs> so you need to know, the, know, the, know the, how opposite things work. You see? When heat is very strong, then you use air condition. When it's too cold, then you reduce the temperature. So like that, the best way of dealing with other people, for example, if somebody is very angry, as I already mentioned, that person is already mad, crazy. So you, so, so you, you also want to become crazy, number one. If you also become crazy, you will also become mad, then you will have no idea what you are doing, what you are saying. So at the end of that, you will, you will also become a loser if you have to go to the court. But if you maintain your coolness and patience and say the right thing and not those which is not right, you will win, you see. So you need to know how this counter forces work. So sometimes the best solution for anger is, that's why in Buddhism the best solution for anger is patience. Patience. There is a whole chapter on patience. Many of you have not read that book, Bodhicharya Avatara. You should read it. One of the best book on ethics, wrote in the 8th century. There are now commentaries also there. I will try to bring some copies for some of you. None of you have seen that book? Yeah, yeah, we have. Yeah. Here. Bodhisattva way of life. Yeah, we have we have plenty in the library. So I'll see how much we have. Yeah, yeah, I know. But how many? They, they, if, if they want to take it with them, then maybe they don't have. Yeah, yeah. So they can read. They, they, you can buy? Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Yeah, they can buy it from us also if they are. Yeah. Anyway, some of these books you should read. Okay, next question. Yes. Hello again. Mm. Namaste. Mm. Okay, uh, so I have this question in my mind. So I wanted to ask, like, does isolation helps? Okay, in the sense, I'm not saying exactly like go into the woods or forest or uh, in the upper Himalayas and just start living alone. But does isolation helps, like being alone for some yes. time and uh, at some place where nobody knows you and like there are no friends and families? And like along with this, um, uh, just uh, does being silent helps? Like just being silent, like for a good amount of time. Yes, okay. yeah. being silent helps. Being living in isolation helps. But but uh, whether you really should go into isolation or not is up to you. How how you are going to do that? Because even if you isolate yourself, if you don't exercise your mind and practice, it is of no use. You may be able to distance yourself from your family, moderation from your family members and things like that. But uh, in terms of spiritual practice, you will gain nothing just by isolating yourself. In fact, there is a very famous stanza where it says, if you practice, even if you remain as a householder, there is a liberation. If you practice. If you don't practice, even if you isolate yourself and move into the top of mountain, you'll just, you will continue to accumulate causes for negative birth, not liberation. And then he gives the example. Like in, the, in India, there were king, kings and ministers who got enlightened, who achieved nirvana. They have household like Marpa, the famous 
teacher of Miller Hepa. How many of you read the book by Miller Hepa? If you read this book, you will be flabbergasted. He is said to be the, the, the king of all the practitioners in Tibet. And he, he is said to have achieved enlightenment in one lifetime. The hardships that he encountered, you won't believe it. Life history of Milarepa. Life history or biography of Milarepa. And then, the, then his 100,000 songs that he sang when he was moving into the mountain. He was basically running away from people. He became a meditator. It's a very long moving story. And he was mistreated by his uncle and aunt. Then he went to learn black magic. And he became expert in black magic, bring hailstorms, killed many birds and people. Then he repented it and then became a great practitioner, was able to even fly, things like that. It's a very, very interesting story. But he was always running away from people and remaining naked in snow mountains. You won't believe those things. But it's, it's a very interesting read. That actually shows your mental deed. And then his 100,000 songs, such a powerful teaching and inspiration. <laughs> so I'm asking you to read more and more, yeah. But that his biography is not very thick. Yeah, the next. Um, hi. Yeah. Where do you stand and where does Buddhism stand when it comes to consuming the news? Because mm. um, you've spoken about the importance of thinking globally, but also I feel like it's quite a common thing with people who are on the spiritual path or the enlightened path to purposely avoid the media because they don't want the negative emotions or it brings them down. But equally, isn't that a kind of ignorance? And if we're in a privileged position where we can access news and we can learn about like, genocides happening and countries being occupied, then we have a responsibility to do that. So how do we balance that responsibility with taking positive action and the yeah, there, there, are, there could be many responses. One is, <laughs> as we say, no news is good news. <laughs> so, basically, you know, taking a clue from how human beings have been living before, we're also the same human being living today with different technological products, at our disposal. Otherwise, we are same human beings, same emotions. So basically, even without watching news, you can figure out what is happening. A general idea you can have. Huh? In my case, I uh, number one, I must confess, I am not a great practitioner. Okay, don't expect me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so therefore, therefore, I am hodgepodge. You know, <laughs> I I am you know jack of all, master of none. <laughs> so I I'm you know born in Tibet in a very religious country. Then I become monk at a very young age. I got this opportunity to go to ordinary schools, and learn mathematics and geography and English and all those stuffs. And then, you know, uh, entered to study Buddhist philosophy for many many years then become translated to his holiness. So I have, luckily or unluckily, whatever, great exposure to many things. Visited so many countries. I visited over 30 countries. And uh, so I have, I have still, you know, almost every day I'm seeing people coming, you know, so I have that exposure. Then in my home also, I have a nice TV, you know, don't think I'm doing that, practicing meditation, sitting there, you know, you know I, I watch news, you know, I'm very updated about all the news. You ask me and I'll answer you. What is happening between right now between Iran and Iraq, you know? 130 missiles fired from Iran to you know, Israel. Not Iraq, sorry, Israel and Iran. And Israel is now planning to retaliate. All those things I'm updated. So so what I'm saying is this most of the news they have same same news. They're all repetitions. 
just one one or two good news you watch and then you the rest are more or less saying the same thing. So you don't have to spend a lot of time understanding these things. So that way you keep informed but you also don't waste too much of your time. Right? Does that answer your question? And then the most important thing probably answering your question is we call our age age of information. Very proudly we say age of information. But much of the information you get is junk information. So therefore you need to sift the right information from the wrong information and as much as possible use your, as I already mentioned, use your brain to find out, not just listening, find out and get the good information. Uh, uh? Exactly. Exactly, exactly. Even His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Nowadays, because of his age, I don't know. But earlier, he always in the morning watches BBC and then listen to the radio. <coughs> because as we say in political science, what touches all must be affected by all. You can't say I'm a practitioner, I have nothing to do with these people. Oh, all this in flood and fire, I don't care, I sit on the mountain. Doesn't make sense because you are talking about well-being of all sentient beings, right? So, so you don't get obsessed with this watching news and all these things, but at least you should keep informed, so that you are able to better deal with many of these problems. What is the, uh, if something you know destructive, negative things happening today? What is the Buddhist answer to this? How can we, you know, learn from these problems? Because all these challenges, problems are unfortunately not good but not necessarily completely bad you never know what is going to come next time human story is like that you know improving then falling down then changing then uh, like that you see it's like that and even with atom bombs now we have over 20,000 atom bombs right now right so in a way it's really awful but some people, they don't think this is awful. They say, this is a deterrent. We are killing less people than earlier. Many people are saying things like that. So I don't know. But actually speaking, the, the killing done in year 2021 and 22, if you compare this to in the year 2022, the killing has doubled. There's more killing now. Because we have more dangerous weapons. So anyway, by by... By being informed with all this, we need to gradually come up. This is an almost an uphill task, but we need to talk about this and uh, gradually learn to say no to atom bombs. Some of this very destructive. At the end of the day, it is people, you know, that has to change. So there should be a global kind of mobilization of this disarmament. And he's already, he's already written books on that disarmament right otherwise as Einstein said that, that there will be a lot of destruction if there's third world war and then in case there is a fourth world war the fourth world war will be fought with stones and the sticks this is what Einstein said meaning that at that time there's no destructive weapons everybody has killed each other and what is left behind is few people and stone and sticks Right. <laughs> but then India, I tell you about this atom bombs with India. Shall I tell you the story? There was a time when atom bomb was a privileged possession of some countries. India was not allowed to produce atom bomb. India tried very hard. They are having difficult time. Then finally they decided to make it make atom bomb. And the, when they made the first atom bomb, they called it Buddha bomb. <laughs> I wanted to tell you this, Buddha bomb. Meaning that this is for peaceful purposes, not for destructive purposes. That we'll see, we'll read more and discuss more. <laughs> but at least that was the intention.
because if you really use it as a deterrent, then maybe peaceful purposes, yeah. Otherwise, everybody who has atom bomb will believe you. Yeah, okay. One last question. Oh, no, no, few, few more questions. Yes. Yes. You have to do a lot of running today. <laughs> if you kept on going, you must have reached uh, Delhi. <laughs> <laughs> The question is also about negative emotions uh -huh. and about how to dethrone them and take their power away without suppressing them. Or what is your perspective on suppressing emotions? Because what I see many times, also in my personal case, oh, I really want to be a good person so I cannot get angry, I shouldn't get angry. But then it's all just being put behind. Behind and then one day, you know, with a lot of people it can explode when yeah, they're yeah. just always putting it behind. And also what I see or experience is that a lot of time actually being with the emotion or being present with it without reacting leads me more to the seed of it, to see what no, is underneath. The suppressing, suppre suppressing means if you just suppress it without further ill will and hate it, then this suppression is useful. You suppress it and you have no ill will, so it will disappear. You did not express it, so that other people didn't get hurt. So that way it is good. But if you suppress it, but deep down there is a disliking and <laughs> hate it, then this will fester. Then one day it will explode. So that is not good. In that case, it is better that you say the right thing. Get angry and say the thing, express it, then finish. No hatred, no anger. That is better. Right? Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, wow. <laughs> there is a lot of bad in the world, but God is everywhere. So God is everywhere. What? What did you say? God, God. Yeah, yeah. Created everything. Yeah. So, if he created, don't you think that he created the good and the evil in order for higher purpose that we don't understand yet? <laughs> From Buddhist viewpoint, as I said, Buddhists don't believe in a creator God. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> according to according to Buddhism, we are the creators. All the problems that we have here are created by us. Huh. And in fact, His Holiness said, we created all the problems and then asked the God for solution. It's unfair. <laughs> 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 but but this, those people who believe in God, you know, I don't know whether they say everything is created by God or not. I don't know. I'm not so sure about that. Now, even if they say everything is created by God, then when there is a problem, they still think, oh, there may be some, some purpose. So that at least helps them, their mind, you see. So that way, it is useful. So the question really is not so much about whether there is a God out there or not. It is the inspiration that we get. For example, if you think about a God as a fatherly figure up there in the heaven somewhere, you, 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 you are a little bit careful about you know, doing good things and not doing bad things, you know, things like that. You're a little bit more cautious and careful because your fatherly, the God figure is watching you, you know. So that helps you become a better person. So that way it is useful. It's really not so much about whether there is a God out there or not. It's the benefit that we get, probably. But otherwise, from Buddhist, purely from Buddhist viewpoint, accepting a cre creator God is illogical. Because we say all things are created by God. Then who created God? God is no creator. This is illogical. If everything has to be created, then God, the so-called God, has also to be created by someone else. It also has to have a cause and a condition. Without any cause, without any condition, somebody becomes so big, so powerful, so good. It's impossible. And we are struggling to become good. We are not improving, not able to do that. <laughs> so that way it is <laughs> illogical. But whatever be the case, the, the important thing is the message 
that we get from all the religions. Right? Okay. Yeah. But in Buddhism also we say suffering is introduction to happiness. So sufferings and challenges we don't want, but actually we learn more from those challenges and sufferings than, than when we don't face challenges and sufferings. When everything is okay, you hardly learn anything. I keep on talking about the importance of meditation on death and things like that. You'll say, yes, yes, Geshila, yes, yes, but no, nobody will practice it. I know that. But if you suddenly become very sick and ill, and doctor tells you, you might die, then you will do the greatest practice. <laughs> because unless you actually face, that's why I'm saying, you should actually practice. Go to the cemeteries. <laughs> See the dead bodies. You know, our attitude is such that we, we are very fearful of seeing dead bodies. Shanti Deva in his famous book, The Bodhisattva Way of Life, he says, you people are kind of stupid. He didn't say stupid, but he, say, he was saying something like this. You should actually fear these people who are alive, not those who are dead. These people who are alive, they are zombies. They will manipulate you, they will exploit you, they will harm you, be very careful. The dead body, do nothing. It's like another piece of stone. But because we don't want to die, and you see an example, then you get scared, you see. So that's why I'm saying everything is dependent upon your knowledge and understanding. And the problem with us is we fear those where we should not have fear and have no fear to those where we should have fear. Right? Yes. Hmm. So uh, what I've seen essentially is at some point, emotions fade away in a sense. Let's say if someone close to me died, mm. after six months, seven months, I'll kind of forget about that, be stable in that context. So what is the kind of positive happiness, long lasting you're talking about that will never fade and it will be perpetual in nature? Like, I'm not able to connect the dots. You see how negative emotion fades away. Why would positive emotion never go away? And how, would, how could it ever you know, last. No, once you understand the way things are, the reality, the law of nature, then you will be able to see the so-called suffering, happiness, these are mental designations. Like the hardships that the Olympians undergo for you and me, who are not in that line, is a kind of suffering. But for them, it's not suffering because they are voluntarily accepting it. They perspire, they get up early in the morning, you know, they break their leg, whatever. They'll do it because you, you're, you're, you're in that, you, you're passionate about that. So it's your mental attitude. It's your mental attitude, how you think about it. So what was the main question? Uh, my question was, I mean, how would it be perpetual? Yeah, 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 nature, yeah perpetual, right? yeah, perpetual. So that means all these sufferings arise, as I said, negative emotions, from negative emotions. So once you are without these negative emotions, which, which means once you are without the ignorance, then even when your very close friend dies, you will not cry, you will not weep, you will not shed tears. Instead, when that person is alive, you will be very nice, very supportive, you do good things. When that person goes, no reason to weep. And no use to weep. That's why the Buddha is saying that you people are doing all the useless things. Useful things that you should do, you are not doing. Useless things you are doing. When you are living together, you are not so nice. When that person dies, you shed your crocodile tear. No use. And then in fact, he goes further by saying that if you really have to cry for somebody's death, then you should cry every second. Every second somebody is dying. They are all your relatives. They are all your mother sending beings. And what, what is the use of that crying? Right? So we, we, because of misunderstanding, lack of knowledge, we keep on doing all the useless things. Useful things we don't do. Like for example, our meeting here in the next four or five days, 
After five days, I'll go. Will you cry after me? A little bit. <laughs> And and I I I I I can hundred percent say that you you all will be very nice to me, in these five six days, because you know that we are here for a short time. So you try to smile, I try to smile, you know. <laughs> we spend our time nicely. Then say why Gishilan, why this that, you know. So because we know that we are here together for a few days. So similarly with your relatives, your friends. You're also for a short time. How long? Nobody knows, as I already mentioned, you see. So be nice. And when that person goes, okay. And then it's our human tendency that the so-called, the, the, per, the person, the so-called, that person who you loved so much, for <laughs> there is a line which says that the so-called, your beloved girlfriend dies, you feel very miserable. The next time you meet another, attractive girlfriend, you will forget that and marry that. This is the, the game we play in the world, you see. This is a game we play without, without realizing the, the, the deeper realities, you see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, regarding negative emotions, mm. so uh, at a moment like when you are doing some activity mm. and a negative emotion strikes, so the whole vibration of your body changes. Yeah, yeah. And at that time, I try some things like uh, try to get a better feeling thought. So thinking about something that feels better, something else. Yes. That helps sometimes. Yes. But some of the times the damage has already been done. So now when you say like uh, to get rid of the root cause, the seed of the negative emotion, yeah. when we are going for this, do you recommend looking at uh, like uh, working on the antidote like you said for anger, uh, you said like uh, patience, Patience, yes. Yeah. So working on being patient or trying yeah. to confront like why am I angry? Like where no, should I focus more? No, this is like same. When you talk about practicing patience, you are already asking the question: When I, when, why, why, sh why am I getting angry? What is, what is use of anger? No use. So be patient. Basically, it's, it's, this is the same thing, right? And uh, with but fear. then the root cause is not just practice of patience. Root cause of all negative emotions is ignorance. Misconception of the reality. Misconception of the reality. Much of the problem that we face are due to lack of knowledge. For example, if I look at you with a very kind of angry face, then I say something. You will get very upset and angry. Why Geshe is saying all the bad things and so angry? Actually, I was not saying any bad thing. I was chanting mantra. I was chanting some mantra. So this is a misconception, you see. So many of our experiences are based, based, you know, based on misconception of reality and then we flare out, get angry, you see. So that's not the solution. So, yeah, sometimes as you said, you know, damage is already done, you got angry, you said some nasty word or even kick that person, whatever. Then after that, you learn from that. What did you get b by that? Regarding like, uh, fear. Huh? So well, let's come to fear. Yeah. So I'm going to do something yeah. and I can do this and I'm so excited and I'm about to jump. And just at the last second, the back of my mind, oh shit, maybe I cannot do this. And then everything gets messed up. So how do I deal with that? So therefore, <laughs> think before you act, as we say. <laughs> so plan properly. It's not just you know immediate excitement that you jump and do something. You know, you should see how much money you have. You know, what is your expertise? How many people are working with you? All those things. Plan properly, and then, and also in life, it is not good idea to start doing too many things. Do one thing good, 
Stick to one or maybe two, not more than that. Small things, okay, no problem. But if you are doing a big project, a relatively big project, do one thing good. If you, whatever it is, if you do one thing good, that will encourage you to do more things. People will give you more recognition. Then you will shine out. If you start a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit there, because there is a promise of money. And then at the, with, with, the, with the promise of the money, they also say there is a deadline, you know. And you are unable to meet the deadline. And before you meet the deadline, you will be a dead person, you see. <laughs> so I got some like good offers from some people to do this, do that, with this deadline. I said, forget it, get lost. I don't want to waste my life, you know. So my life is happier, you see. So the, the temptation will be there. So don't just run after ten, tem, temptation. <laughs> See carefully <laughs> whether you can do it or not. Yeah. It should be, it's not enough to have good high M, but it should be manageable. Recently I met a relatively quite rich person. So she was also asking some questions. She wanted to go up and up and up. I said, I mean, it's, it's none of my business, you know, you have the way and the means, you know, you can, it's up to you, but since you asked me, in the long run, it is always better to do something that is manageable. Right? Yeah. Okay. Good evening, night, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and to see you tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you. <coughs> so the